Hello there. Have you stumbled into an open manhole recently? <laughs> <laughs> Hello there. Have you stumbled into an open manhole recently? Do you find yourself in the company of strangers? Well, then you just might be in the future underground. My name is Hunter Lanier. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> On our channel, we will be discussing a new Criterion Channel movie every single week, without exception. <laughs> On today's episode. <laughs> <laughs> On today's episode, we will be uh, reviewing Godland. Godland, which is directed by Hilner Parmesan, released in, <laughs> 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 released in 2022, uh, a co-production between Iceland and Denmark, starring Elliot... We're going to post-production all these names, because I can't read all of these uh, Icelandic names. Yeah, we'll, we'll lip-sync them. Okay. Synopsis. The struggle between the structures of religion and our own brute animal nature plays out amid the beautifully forbidding landscapes of remote Iceland in this stunning psychological epic from director... Leonard Parmesan. Hubert Parmesan. Hubert... <laughs> Hubert... In the... <laughs> <laughs> In the late 19th century, Danish priest Lucas makes the perilous trek to Iceland's southeastern coast with the intention of establishing a church. There, the arrogant man of God finds his resolve tested as he confronts the harsh terrain, temptations of the flesh, and the reality of being an intruder in an unforgiving land. What unfolds is a transfixing journey into the heart of colonial darkness, attuned to both the majesty and terrifying power of the natural world. And joining me on today's episode is Hello there. William. Sim Don't talk over your name. <laughs> it's William Simpson. That's me. I also live here. <laughs> I don't actually live here. I do literally live here. <clears throat> and the leap, uh, last name pending. My last name has actually been established before. Uh, it's uh, Dalip Saha. Uh, I'm our New York City correspondent. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And you're where? Are you like right here? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, He's yeah. wherever we want him to be. Put him down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, wait. On the table. Sorry. Sorry, Dalip. Okay. okay. So, uh, I think the best way to start is just to get everyone's uh, basic impressions. Where are you, Dalip? Right here? <laughs> yeah. Basic impressions. Forever, yeah. So, uh, William, why don't you tell me, uh, after the movie was over, how did you feel about it? I loved it. Uh, it's, it's really wow. slow, but it doesn't feel its length, I don't think. Uh, it's phenomenally well shot. Uh, it, it really feels like uh, every shot could have been... Uh, like a portrait that he was taking. Uh, well, I did. Did there. you watch the director interview that was with uh, the movie? No. Okay. Well, it turns out the director is a photographer. It makes sense. Which yeah, it makes total sense after you watch the movie. Uh, Dalip, what were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Will. I thought it was just simply gorgeous, and it was definitely slow. I would have thought it was like kind of meandering. Like, yeah, we get it. Beautiful nature, blah blah blah. But it definitely tied into the theme of the movie about the relentless power of nature and force of nature over man and i just thought the characters were awesome the performances were great and honestly the uh what i walk away thinking about mostly is just the vast and varied landscapes that were presented like all throughout the movie like so i really didn't mind the slow pace at all and it really picked up by the end yeah i'm, well, I'm glad you mentioned uh nature because so the first movie uh, this movie made me think of was Scorsese's Silence. Did any of you see that one? Yeah, we, I, we both yeah, seen that. I'm pretty I, sure. I saw it a few, few years ago. Okay, yeah. So it, it, uh, the connection is there on a uh, on a content level because both are about priests traveling, going to a different land, uh, being kind of a stranger in a strange land. Right, having their faith tested. Yeah. Now the difference is that I think Godland to me 
the relation it's to me it was almost like a protestant silence hmm. because you know Mark Scorsese is very catholic and when you watch the silence it's very character focused and it's very much about um, how the characters are having their faith tested or uh, strengthened or diminished in various ways whereas this movie to me and I think this worked against it for me which is that it feels very detached it's a very cold, it's a very cold movie yeah. and um, God in this movie to me whereas like in silence I would say God is sort of almost a character that the characters can have a relationship with Whereas in this movie, this, this movie's version of God is a very, um, uh, I guess is the word deific, deism. Right, it, like indifferent, right? Yeah, non, yeah, a non-interventionist kind of nature God. Right. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And also just the fact that the movie has almost no uh, soundtrack, where the soundtrack is essentially water, a river rushing or wind blowing or birds chirping. Yeah, I was kind of joking with uh, William about that. Like, there were some ASMR vibes with just how much we get to look at, like, kind of just a lot of diegetic sound and, like, just really calming and repetitive sounds. Like, all his different actions and stuff, like, preparing, like, an old animal for, like, cooking. Like, it's all shown in, like, great detail, great, like, like sound work. Like, yeah, hardly any music at all. Like you said, it's sparse. Yeah, that, that actually really worked for me, though. Um, like, like, I think silence is, is a great... Uh, comparison to make, uh, where there it, it really feels like they're they're in conflict with the Japanese Inquisition for me more than anything, and like there's a lot more sort of uh, I guess direct conflict where with Godland it, it, it really feels like you know God is just this is just this uncaring you know like you said indifferent sort of mm -hmm. force of nature like like he's in conflict with Iceland itself. The director also brought up. When he was talking about his influences, uh, Ingmar Bergman, who this is Criterion Channel, which has like a lot of Ingmar Bergman stuff on it, so this is relevant. Um, but so Ingmar Bergman, religion was like a big part of his movies, and like the way he deals with it is more intellectual, where he's kind of like intellectualizing things. He's kind of like working through concepts in his head. Okay. And whereas in this movie, again, it's more, it's like God exists as a backdrop or as a world and the characters are just kind of like in it. Um, so he deals with religion in a way that is, in my opinion, probably the least interesting way you could deal with it. It seemed to me, I don't know what, say, I don't know what the relationship is between Denmark and Iceland, but you know, the priest speaks a different language than everyone else, than the village. And that immediately, right. He's isolated from the very beginning. Right, it immediately sets him apart. There's a there's a a wall between him and the other people, and I think it's there from the language and the culture. Which again, I'm kind of ignorant. I don't know the differences between those two places um, or what their history is. Um, yeah, same. But uh, so there's a, a a wall there, and then also I think there's a moment in the movie. I don't think I wrote it down where one of the character characters is talking to his daughter. I think. And he says something like, there's no place for this man here. So I think there's also a wall between uh, a priest who in this environment of like people who work with their hands, their farmers, you know, their entire life is about utility. And here is a kind of like a scrawny, artsy priest that likes to take photographs. And there's not really a place for him in their world. Did either of you get that impression at all? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it feels like there, there are statements it's trying to make about colonialism. And I, and I think that, that kind of plays into it is, you know, he, he's just not welcome. And there, there's all these uh, sort of contrasts it makes. Like, uh, I remember at the very beginning of the movie, um, He's taking a portrait of uh, the, the sort of, I don't know, like a senior priest or whatever, mm -hmm. whoever his boss is at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's on this like fake painted backdrop. Uh, and then later in the movie, there's this uh, sort of like supercut of all of all the portraits that he's taken over the course of the movie. And the I think it's the last one in there is this uh, like super staged uh, fake looking priest on like a, a corny uh, background. Hmm. Uh, and it, it really does feel like 
he's just separate. Like there's no place for him. Yeah. And also I thought it was, I don't know, maybe this relates to that in some way, but the fact that he, it seems like he can never get a good photograph. Like at first, like the pe people are moving and then he tries to take a picture of the girl on the horse and the horse kind of like goes away. So I thought that was interesting. Like why the fact that he can never, you know, there's some like incompetence to him. Like he, he, can't, he kind of sucks as a priest. Like he's a bad priest. He, he didn't have, for being a photographer and for being a priest, he was a really impatient dude, I would say. Like uh, just, I, I just felt like he, from the very beginning of the movie, we kind of saw like, he just wasn't very sympathetic towards people. Like not really, I don't know, patient with people and like their differences. And like, once he lost that interpreter from the very beginning, I feel like he just kind of, pulled him into himself even more and just became even more isolated like as a result. Do you hope that there's something in by? Of all the of all the images in the movie was there one that you think stuck out to you the most, William? Um, yeah, there's a few. Uh, I, there, there's multiple kind of time lapse shots of like the dying horse. Yeah, the dying horse, uh, and then of the the priest uh, at the end. Um, those stick out to me for sure. Uh, I really love the double title card um, of the like uh, in Danish Godland with the blue flag behind it, and then the, with the red flag behind it in Icelandic. Godland. How about you, Dilip? Mm -hmm. Any uh, specific images? Yeah, just definitely like the parallels between uh, his horse that was dying and decaying, and then his own bones by the end of the movie and how they were decaying through all the seasonal changes. It kind of was a great representation of through all four seasons, or I'm not sure of the uh, climate of uh, Iceland, but just how it paves over humanity. It's so indifferent to just your decay. like. You know, like you're kind of helpless in the face of it. And he was just kind of, I thought, unprepared from the beginning. And then it didn't help at all when his only connection to the foreign people died like so early on. And due to kind of his own brash actions too, and like his indifference, like his tour guide Ragnar, right? Tried to warn him about the heavy, like flowing water. And he was just like, he kind of knew, thought he knew better, tried to force the crossing and due to kind of his own actions he lost his first link to to these people in this foreign land i would say yeah he seems like at least i would say top five worst priests i've ever seen in the movie um i'm trying to think of the other ones yeah, it's out of like stuff i've seen maybe in spotlight yeah he was up there oh yeah the, yeah yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah worse. he could be a little bit worse you're right <laughs> yeah he seems not that invested in being a priest honestly but yeah he, I like mean, maybe so he I, would rather be doing something there was, else there was one moment there's the moment where the dog is barking outside right and he gets like irritated like as you were saying to leap like impatient he, he was irritated at the baby crying too right like even before like really the dog started get going like yeah then he walks outside and he trips in the mud and he falls on his face and I, yeah. in, in that moment, I did have the thought, like, I wonder if his parents were priests. And, like, he just kind of, like, <laughs> you know, you kept some people, like, are they, they're, like, miserable their whole life because they do what their yeah, parents Yeah, like, life. for how, I guess, relatively easily he disconnected from his religion, it does make you think, like, was he just pushed into it, like, by his family? Like, he never had a true personal connection to it. Like, it definitely made you think. And that was also, like, I'm glad you brought up that shot, like, of him slipping in the mud and the shit and just getting it all over him. It kind of exposes like inner self to us like that was also one of the most iconic shots i would say too so uh, yeah so i brought up the shots because i think the sh the uh shot that uh stuck with me the most was the foot like pressing against the wet moist grass oh right one? i think i do yeah okay. when they're camped yeah and he's doing his like morning routine yeah and you see his foot like it's like, the, it's like the grass is made out of a sponge. For some reason that, that uh, stuck with me. I thought that was cool. Yeah. yeah, no, there is one shot that stuck with me, which is it's in the same scene and he's doing his like stretches. Oh, he's like yoga, he's like- Yeah, his yoga and he does that like spin around. And, like Jane Fonda uh, aerobics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Yeah. Ragnar, Ragnar's routine was pretty good during the morning. I'm not gonna lie, his, his dedication. Yeah, he just needed some leggings. 
<laughs> um, yeah, yeah, headband, hairspray, yeah. a purse for his dog, maybe. Yeah, Still. yeah. So we were we were talking about uh, the way the movie is shot, which is it's obviously visual before anything else. Like in terms of like the layers of what you want to do with a movie, like he's obviously putting visuals at the front. Is that safe? Y'all agree with that? Yeah, I, I agree. Like it just, I feel like the movie directly shows like the ties between you know photography and film, like you know cinematography, like like with it being like I guess like four three ratio, like everything looked like a portrait. And then Will brought up earlier like that super, like kind of montage of all the portraits he'd been doing. Like that scene really made you kind of being like uh put your, put yourself in like the shoes of like a photographer and 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 also i guess the director of the movie itself like with just how he composed every shot you know it was beautiful yeah it's funny because the aspect ratio initially so i don't like when aspect ratios are used in kind of an artsy way just for no reason because it's kind of an obvious yeah it's like an easy thing to do to make your movie like like if you're gonna make a, different yeah if you're, if you're gonna make your movie like a parody of a like an art house movie the, the first thing you would do is it's definitely four by three yeah 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so at first that kind of bothered me because i was like oh boy um and then it started to irritate me even more because the landscapes were so beautiful i was like i wish i could see more of these yeah, um, yeah, the whole yeah. Whole but then again, scene. again, I watched that interview with the director that's also on the Criterion Channel, and he specific he says that originally it was in widescreen because of the landscapes, and then he didn't think it was intimate enough, so they changed it, and I don't I don't really that didn't make it feel any more intimate to me. Yeah, that's fair. I like it from the perspective of like. He's a photographer and you yeah, know his it, photos would have been that size. But I agree that I don't know if it adds anything to the movie beyond that. It seems more aesthetic where like you could imagine he made the movie and you found you found it buried next to a dead guy's skeleton or something. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then also in that same dark director interview, he brings up he specifically mentions other directors that influenced him and he says Kubrick, Tarkovsky, uh and also Bergman, but you can tell that because like Stanley Kubrick movies to me and Tarkovsky movies, they're both, I have the same problem with those because they're very detached and very cold and very, um, you know, the, the visuals and the framing is like the number one thing. Right. Cause like overstory and character. And like, yeah. Kind of cause, cause like I enjoyed watching. Movie. Yeah. Cause so I enjoyed watching the movie. It was always visually interesting, but I don't think I would ever go back to it. I don't think there's enough. It's like, it's a really nice bone with not a lot of meat on it. Yeah. I, I could get some of that. I talked to Will about this. I felt like some of the relationship aspects were kind of undercooked with uh him and that uh daughter of that lord later in the movie speaking of characters uh what do y'all think about the relationship between lucas and ragnar because that's that one seemed important Spe uh, specifically there's a scene where they're building the church and ragnar kind of opens up in a way and he says how do i become a man of god or something to that effect right he's open to it yeah, and the and the, the the girl has to translate, and he has this anecdote about where. So the response to that from Lucas is something kind of simple, like kind of like a boring religious answer, like give yourself to God. Yeah, like whatever yeah, default he's been yeah. trained to say. Is, yeah. yeah, and Ragnar's response is that he tells the story of when he was a kid. Um, I'm looking at the leapers once more. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, he tells a story of when he was a kid and his mother told him about I think it was the king of Denmark who was a man and so in his head he drew like a heuristic to become the king of Denmark I must become a man so if, if I become a man I'm bec I become the king of Denmark and that was his response to Lucas's answer and to me that spoke to maybe Ragnar's saying that's kind of a bullshit answer like it's that's a little too simple 
So to me, I think I felt like that was an important aspect of their relationship. But what did their relationship? Do you have any thoughts on those two? I mean, Ragnar just seems more practical, and Lucas just feels like his faith can get him through everything. And I don't know. Ragnar just wants him to stay more grounded, like give his strength, like to this journey. But Lucas is thinking like so far ahead, almost about like this pressure to build the church and kind of his own faith that he's lost, especially after his translator died. So I don't know. His head was in a different place, you know, like Ragnar was more about like the lay of the land, like kind of person. Like, I don't know. Right. And I think, I think that's, I think it's like the main difference between Lucas and everyone else is that, uh, I, I like that he is both a priest and a photographer. Cause I don't know if I said this already, but I think religion and art, they kind of represent the same thing in a society. They offer people some kind of otherworldly, non-practical way of looking at things that can help them. It's almost like a cheat code. Um, so yeah, I think that was, I think that disconnect is uh, really a big part of the movie. Yeah, I think you feel that a lot with Ragnar and Lucas in particular too, because uh, it feels like Ragnar maybe sees God in that kind of like, you know, indifferent force of nature, Iceland kind of way, where yeah. I think Lucas sees God as like a set of rules that he has to follow. You know what I mean? Right, right. And yeah. And so I kind of want to get back to where I think, because I think I don't, I think I disliked the movie. I mean, I liked the movie, but I think y'all liked it a little bit more than I did. And I'm trying to get down to, for me, it's just that there weren't enough, like I said, there's just not enough there outside of an aesthetic appreciation of what I'm looking at. I think that's very fair. There could have been a lot stronger, like, character aspects and, like, more fleshed out characters just in general, like, even starting from Lucas, like, I don't know. We, f I feel like we learned a lot more maybe about him in the first half of the movie during the journey rather than when he settled actually in the town. But I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's, it's tough because especially since the movie's kind of split up into two sections, you know, when yeah. he's getting to the town yeah. and then once he's there, it, it feels like a lot of the character it, stuff is it lacking. Definitely, it definitely becomes a different time. movie. Yeah. I'm yeah, either. that's true. I agree with y'all that I think some of the characters are kind of like archetypal and basic. I still, I still really like the movie though. I think I'll just the there. visuals could do carry it for me, you know, and and just yeah, like yeah. the execution of everything. Are there ideas about how the movie kind of circled back on itself, or like did you like one half of it more than the other? Like, what, like we said, it was divided into two sections. Like, would you say you like the journey part more than the settling part? Actually, yeah. Like, as much as there's not that much happening in, in the first half of the movie, uh, I, I really like all the setup stuff. Or I, I should I, I really like all the stuff at the very beginning with him and the that, like, senior priest guy. I like the, uh, the stuff at the beginning with him and Ragnar, where they just, like, there's conflict, like, immediately, you know? Like, uh, I think the first thing that uh, Lucas says to Ragnar is, like, where's my horse? And then the, the the first thing that Ragnar says back is like you know calls him called a Danish devil or whatever. Um, I liked a lot of that stuff. I thought it was really just kind of immediately engaging, um, and I loved all the nature photography I shots. Too. Yeah, I that mean, makes sense. I do too. It's just like the first half of the movie is all the journey, all the nature shots. So. I like them too. I'm just not. I'm never gonna watch Planet Earth a second time. <laughs> You that's know? fair. See, maybe that's the difference. I've seen Planet Earth like <laughs> ten times. So yeah, that's the thing. I just love Planet Earth and stuff like that. I could watch it all day. This male alone rules the meadow. He stands eight feet tall. His muscles hardened by years of sparring. Today, a challenger for his title has come forward. Full-blown fights are so dangerous, they're not entered into lightly. But when two males square up, it's time to clear the arena.
So, final thoughts. My final thoughts. Didn't have a lot there that I would go back to. Um, but I loved the shot of the foot against the moist grass. Which in a movie of visuals, where visuals are the primary thing, I don't know, I think that's valid that I like the foot on the grass. I, I think that's, yeah. Okay, so stop. Okay. <laughs> no judgment. Leave Wait, who's judging you? <laughs> um, you can like feet. It's fine. Okay. Well, mm. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. So I, I, I like the movie uh, visually. Everywhere else, I wasn't that into it. But I think the director set, did what he set out to do. So, uh, you know, live and let live. That's fair. Uh, I don't know. I liked it a lot. Um, it's it's a, a little thin on plot. It's a little thin on character stuff. But I think what's there really works. Um, and you know, it's like spectacular on a visual level. So yeah, I very good visual. I think it's definitely still worth watching. And also, one thing before we end, it, it's also like uh, it's also uh, I'm trying not to say like so much. It's also very colorful. That's true. Weirdly. Yeah. That was one thing I immediately noticed. So even in that way, it's nice to look at. Yeah, it could easily have been just like really gray. It's very purdy. Yeah. The leap. Uh, I mean, yeah, just similar to you guys. I just, I definitely think it's worth watching. It's a visual marvel, especially in the first half when they're actually on the journey. But yeah, I, I could have used a bit more character and plot to grasp that. I still did definitely like the themes, I think, overall. And the imagery really like hit it home for me in the second half. And I did like the turns with Lucas's character. It was different than what I expected, which is what I like. Like we sometimes see these movies about people given orders and they're actually good people inside. They don't want to hurt others. But in this case, it's like Lucas was sent off on this mission and he himself was already kind of an unsympathetic, stubborn, prudish person. Like, that was never really going to be a good priest. And at the end of the movie, he was still the same way. Like, I guess that maybe the intention of the movie was he wasn't supposed to have an arc. And I don't know. I also remember it. I think it was pretty memorable, pretty beautiful, worth watching. But I would not watch it again. Do you make a good priest? I don't think so. I mean, I think I would listen to people with more sympathy than Lucas, though. And I think if someone asked me, like, you know, how can I become a man of God? I wouldn't totally, like, insult them and try to make them hate my religion, not be a part of it. I don't know. I would try to be more welcoming. Would you have won the... <laughs> I think so. I don't know if I could have been in Ragnar. I don't but... think... It... That, was, yeah. that was a moment. There was a suspension of disbelief where the priest is... Very <laughs> um, He's got the power of God behind him. Oh. Yeah. That's true. I can't be. I, you can't compete with that. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> what about you, William? Would you be a good? Uh, no, I'd be a terrible priest, and I would either. No, bad. Ragnar, both. I could beat Lucas in a fight. Okay, yeah. I think. We all think we, we all think we can beat up. So, yeah, okay. Lucas was a bit of a weak one. <laughs> That's a <hilarious>. weird. <laughs> <laughs> We're watching our review. Uh, come back next week. <laughs> um, next week we will be reviewing Michelle, which is um, like subscribe to the channel and go to all of our social medias. And like them, and subscribe to them, and <laughs> just get all over them, all over them. Comment on them. Just put yourself on the channels and subscribe. <laughs> Come back next week, where we'll be here, wearing the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs>